welcome to the Fat Emperor podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. Hey guys, we're back on cardiovascular disease today, and we have none other than Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, who knows more than kind of pretty much anyone on the planet about atherosclerosis and heart disease root causes. And a new book out, Malcolm, a fantastic title. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And I believe your son or son-in-law or someone came up with that title during a family discussion about the content of this book? Yeah, it was my son, actually. Well, I did it before for doctoring data. So um, he's obviously got a skill for this, if, if nothing else. No, uh, I was just saying, I was trying to explain it to him. I had the idea, I was, I was going to call it What the LDL, which I thought was quite funny. But it wasn't quite right, you know. And um, I thought, no, we need a bit more of this. And I was trying to explain it. I said, right, I have a family power wow, i can't remember when it was uh this is what i'm trying to say in the book it's a bit like an exploration of what really does cause heart disease and and in the end it's, it's a bit of a mystery story of trying to go through it a bit like 12 angry men or something and um and i said and, and it's got a little bit in the end it's it's all it's about blood clotting that's what i want to focus on and uh, we threw a few ideas around and he, he came up with the idea of the clot thickens which is obviously a play on the plot thickens and it's about blood clotting and i thought oh that's very good so um, i tried to claim it was my idea obviously but <laughs> he's, he's not having any of it and unfortunately he has witnesses so uh, <laughs> mm. ah well no it it is a fantastic title absolutely and it, it's so apt and uh, no it's a tour de force the book because it gathers together everything around the processes of heart disease and it shows what it's not because it cannot be. And then it shows what it is because the evidence clearly demonstrates that. Uh, but it will be a surprise to a lot of people, particularly cholesterol lowering people, <laughs> what the actual truth is. But I love the way then at the end it gets into the actions you take. So it's not just about the processes and what it is and what it isn't, which would give people a good guide as to what they need to do to avoid it. Uh, but you actually summarize all of the key things, the best evidence-based things to counter these processes. Yes, well, I think that, that's important. Um, uh, I wrote a book ages ago and then my sister said to me, yeah, but what am I supposed to do? <laughs> that. Oh, for God's sake, you should know that by now. Um, but, <laughs> you know, in the end, yes, to say to people, and I think the other thing that I thought was important was because, um, it's an issue that, that you never really see covered is like well if you do this so if you lower the blood pressure and it's high well how much extra life expectancy are you going to could you get from this are we talking 10 years a month a week five seconds it's something that's really just not done by the mainstream i think is this this issue of increase in life expectancy it's funny because in in cancer treatment that's the that's the only thing that really matters and it's the figure you get if you take this drug for two years, you are likely to live on average six months longer or, or whatever it is. That's the increase in median survival. Um, median, obviously, we'll forget about medians and means and averages. But so essentially I thought, well, of course, that's what most matters to people. There's no point in doing something if it's going to say also, if it's going to reduce your risk of dying of heart disease, but increases your risk of dying of other things. Because in the end, that's what we call a complete waste of time. And there's quite a lot of actions and activities that are like this. So, so when I looked at things like, if you look at statins, for instance, there is a reduction in cardiovascular disease in some people. And you say, well, what does that, what does that extrapolate to in, in life expectancy saving? Even if you, well, and, and, and we share the same uh, ideas that, that pharmaceutical company sponsored trials may overemphasize benefit hugely. Even if you accept them at absolute face value, there was a study done in the um, in the British Medical Journal Open. I'd actually done it, my own study, which managed not to get published. <laughs> so what is the increase in life expectancy from the most beneficial studies that you can find about statins? And it came to uh, 0.75 of a day of increased life expectancy per year of taking the statin. So that's um, one... 420 something of a year of increased life expectancy and that was only for really for the group of people who already had existing heart disease so the, so the actual benefit comes down to if if and that's based on five years of clinical trials because that's as long as those trials are if you say well let's assume it continued for 40 years 
that's that benefit continued for 40 years, which we have no evidence that it does, but let's assume it does. What we're talking about is in the order of about uh, half a month, you know, half of a month or maybe a month maximum of increased life expectancy for taking a statin for 40 years. And that's only in one very small group of people. So when you present it in that way, I think you're also presenting it in a way that people go, well, is that it? And you go, well, yes, that is it. And yet, you know, if, if they had even the slightest side effect or adverse effect, even if it was one four hundredth, one, you know, of a percent of, of damage, it, it wouldn't be worth it from, from the perspective of your overall quality of life for the next 40 years. So, so I think it, it was then looking at those things that make the most difference. What, what will give you five years? What can give you three years? And, uh, and that really was my, my uh, intention in doing this. Um, because then people can say, well, well, how much longer can I get? You know, if I do that, if I do this thing that's going to make my quality of life rubbish for the next 40 years, is it really worth it? Well, until you know how much you're going to get, then there's no point in, in, in having mm -hmm. that discussion. And this is something that, that GPs, doctors, cardiologists, almost no one will tell you. So how much longer am I likely to get? You never get this information. It's quite difficult oh. to establish it exactly. It's quite a complicated thing to do. but And you are pushing the boundaries of, of assumptions quite widely at times. But you can tell. I mean, you can do this. Uh, and so that's really one of the, one of the I thought, the most important thing. You know, can you get an extra 10 years? Can you get an extra 20 years? Can you get an extra five years? Is that worth it to you? Then you can make the decision. So I think that I considered that to be sort of a key way of looking at it. Yeah, and the funny thing, Malcolm, is it's the absolute centerpiece of industry, engineering, of anything that spends money, right, to get a return is the cost-benefit analysis. It's central to everything. Everything we did for 25 years always had a cost-benefit, even small projects, and yet it's missing here, completely missing. And we see it as well with, with any mass medications, really. I even did back of an envelope once I had a discussion with a cardiologist and it happened upon cervical cancer. And you know, the vaccine for cervical cancer, which affects the HPV uh, organism, which often promotes cervical cancer. But when you actually look at the numbers, the number needed to treat in that case is astonishingly enormous for an extremely rare, a very sad disease, but extremely rare in terms of mortality rate. And so wherever you look and apply cost benefit, uh, not everywhere, but on most of the mass medications, you just go, oh my God, it's frightening, the lack of benefit per cost. So there you go. But you know what we might start with is the what it's not. So heart disease is a process, atherosclerosis, it's a multi-factor process in fairness, and that's not a cop-out. Some people say, oh, it's a multifactorial. There's 200 causes. There's nothing we can do about addressing it. But no, honestly, it's multifactorial. Uh, but you've got down to the kernel. But one of the things that most people believe it at least has a lot to do with is cholesterol. So is that the primary thing that it's not? <laughs> Well, it's, there's plenty of things that's not. I mean, it is. I, I don't feel like I've been looking at this for 30 years, and I'm kind of I'm over here, and then you have to come back to here and go. Listen, it's not that, you know. But then, of course, people have been told this for so long. It's such a, a simple story, and I think I've said this to you before. You know, people love a simple story, or as H. L. Mencken uh, once said, for every complicated solution, there's a, a simple explanation uh, that is easy to understand, or simple and easy to understand, and wrong. But but if the story fits, and, and this story fits so well into people's ideas, I mean, when you look at the thickenings in people's arteries, the atherosclerosis, they look a bit squidgy and fatty. They've got cholesterol in them. That, they've got all sorts of other things, and the cholesterol happens to be sort of an incidental finding. When we see fatty, squidgy foods, we look at it and go, ooh, and people are put off by that. You see people who are overweight, and we think, ooh, well, I can understand that people are overweight, I've got problems. So it kind of fits into a, a bias that we all have against fatty, greasy, sticky, gooey things. And then someone says we've got fatty, gre greasy, gooey things in our arteries, and therefore that must be caused by eating fatty, greasy, gooey things. It, it 
I mean, they've even seen a, an episode of The Simpsons where, where Homer Simpson ate a McDonald's burger and then you can see the, it going into his stomach and then going into his artery and then into his heart and then causing a, an increased gooey, sticky thing in his artery. So from a very basic, simplistic, easy to understand narrative, this one has really conquered the world. And I hate to say it, but that's about as scientific as it gets. That is the entirety of the science of the cholesterol hypothesis. Gooey, sticky things that you eat become gooey, sticky things in your arteries. And that's that. And therefore, we need to reduce the amount of gooey, sticky things either in the diet or in your bloodstream and all will be well. Thank you very much. It's like, mm, mm. OK, let's science 101. Every single part of that is so stupid that it, 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 it you know, it, you almost think like saying, look, I'm not even going to discuss this. It's, it's just ridiculous. It's beyond ridiculous. For you to say that means you understand nothing about human biochemistry or physiology or really anything. It just is nonsense. Start to finish, nonsense. And, and that is the reality. And yet it's so, it would be astonishingly hard for someone to believe that that could be the case, that it's all junk science. And all of the cholesterol lipidologists and specialists, one thing I love that came out in your book, they all focus on the detailed science of the cholesterol particles, but they never stand back and look at the process and what's actually going on. They avoid that like the plague. They draw us down from Thomas Dayspring to Atia to all of them. They draw us down into a complex world of particles and dazzle. It's like the classic shell trick or the magician's trick. You draw the audience down away from logic and simple reality and you get them where you want them where you have power over them majesty that's what they do in lipidology but you could you threw out some beautiful examples of where cholesterol cannot essentially be part of this process and there's a whole series of them from the cholesterol crystals you know through to the lpa example we might just riff through some of those examples the most powerful thing to decide a hypothesis is correct or not is to find a falsifying fact. Uh, way more powerful than finding a supporting fact. You can have 50 supporting facts, you still don't prove it. One falsifying fact, and you've disproven it. Now you're doing science. Yeah. Yes. Well, well, I think that, that, that's always true. I mean, um, I'm not quite sure what the strongest falsifying facts are with the hypothesis. I think that... Um, it is interesting that a whole series of drugs were developed um, in, around about the turn of the millennium. Um, they were called cetrapibs. Um, you can look them up if you want. Torsotrapib, evocetrapib, something else cetrapib. Anyway, um, $5 billion, was, I believe, was spent on researching these drugs. And, and what they did was they increased the HDL, the high-density lipoprotein, the, the form of lipoprotein that we call good cholesterol. And, and it reduced the LDL, the low-density lipoprotein, the, the form of lipoprotein we call bad cholesterol. Neither of them are cholesterol. This is another problem, is that the nomenclature is insane. We have substances floating around in our blood that are little spheres which contain fats and cholesterol and other things, and we call them cholesterol. That's like calling a car a human being because cars have human beings inside them. No, a car is a car, and a human being sits inside a car. That doesn't make the human being a car, but never mind. We, you know, we also call some of these lipoproteins, we call them triglycerides, because, because they contain triglycerides. That doesn't make them a triglyceride. The other name for them is a very low density lipoprotein. And so we, we, the nomenclature calls things whatever it decides to call them. And however, going back to my citrapids, the citrapids lowered the low density lipoprotein by up to 40%. In one case, 37% reduction, more than most statins, increased the high density lipoprotein by about 120%, well, it virtually doubled it. Now, according to all the hypotheses kicking around, that we should have seen a dramatic reduction in the rate of cardiovascular disease. The, the actual rate of reduction of cardiovascular disease we saw from these drugs combined was a slight increase in cardiovascular disease. Now, these drugs didn't launch for the very simple reason that they achieved absolutely nothing. 
And even some of the cardiologists who are sort of internationally famous, Stephen Nissen, probably the most influential cardiologist in the world, mm. looked at these results and said, oh, well, maybe we've got everything wrong. I mean, he's changed his mind since, obviously. But um, he, he, he said, well, actually, it looks like raising HDL isn't a good idea, and it looks like maybe lowering LDL isn't a good idea. And then that was that. You hear nothing more of it. Uh, you can look at all sorts of examples. If you look at the high-density good lipoprotein, there was a point, this is the same Stephen Nissen, which, uh, which links on, that they found a population in, in Italy who had a very low HDL level. I can't remember exactly. It was like 50% lower than normal. So in theory, this wonderful protecting good cholesterol should have, should have done good. But they had a very, very low rate of heart disease, much lower than the surrounding population. And the, the heart disease in Italy is relatively low compared to or quite low compared to the UK or the US or Ireland or whatever. They said, well, that doesn't make any sense. So what's going on? Well, they looked at their HDL and they said, aha, there's a specific protein attached to it, which we called APOA1 Milano. You may remember this story. <laughs> it actually had a name, Milano, because the place was near Milan. I don't know, I can't remember what the village is called. Probably something you can't pronounce. So, so they, they synthesized this protein. They stuck it onto HDL and they injected it into people. And, um, and Stephen Nissen said it was amazing. It was like liquid drano. We could see the cholesterol being pulled out of the plaques. The plaques were disappearing. It was like watching a cloud on a summer's day. It just disappeared. Then, and, then, um, and then the company was sold for a billion dollars to, um, to, to Pfizer, who then actually carried out some clinical trials and found it didn't do any bloody good at all. So, again, you have this. People find things. They trumpet the wonderfulness of it. And then it disappears. And you think, well, okay, so is anyone willing to change their minds? You know, you look at the, also the fact is that women generally have about age matched, about a third or a quarter of the rate of heart disease of men. They generally have higher cholesterol LDL levels than men. So the explanation is, ah, oh, well, they're protected by something. Well, yeah, well, or maybe, maybe it doesn't cause heart disease in the first place. So they're, they're not protected. You don't need to look for an explanation because the thing you think is causing heart disease isn't. Anyway, at one point, it was confirmed that basically women were protected by their different sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone. And, um, and, uh, and then they did studies on it, and they found that actually, no, there is no protection from these substances. In fact, if you give estrogen, progesterone to men for things like prostate cancer, it increases their risk of heart disease. So that's another one that says like a busted flush. So wherever you look, you can find these ridiculous busted flushes. And, and you may know that we got together with a group of other people and we looked at the um, LDL level in, and we looked at this in, in, in the population over the age of 60, which is where almost all heart disease deaths occur. We found all the studies we could, we brought them together in a meta-analysis. And what we found was that a, a higher LDL level was not associated strongly, if at all. And in fact, the association was negative, really, overall. In other words, the higher your LDL levels were, the longer you lived. And there was a study in uh, Norway on 50,000 people over 10 years. It was actually the authors wrote to me. I didn't even know the study existed. It was called Hunt 2, carried yeah. out in Dellenberg or wherever it was. And, uh, and they wrote to me and said, oh, look at this. We find that um, if the cholesterol goes from five to about seven, which is five, six, seven, above seven, was the figures they looked at. But in women, the lowest rate of heart disease occurred in people whose L cholesterol was five or lower. And the, sorry, the, the highest rate occurred, heart disease occurred in, in women whose cholesterol was five or lower. And the lowest occurred when it was six and a half, seven and above. And we're talking about quite significant differences here. So you go, well, well, there you are. You know, and, and the biggest study, actually, I think it's the biggest study, was done in Austria. It's called the Vorarlberg study. Look it up, why Eve is an Adam. And they looked at uh, people who ages from 10 to 95 over 15 years. This was an enormous study. And what they found was that the lower the cholesterol level was, the higher the mortality rate was in all the population and age groups that they studied. The, the effect wasn't massive. It was fairly small. Mm. But it, it was still a complete contradiction. And you can find contradictions like this and contradictions like this in fact, the, the, the World Health Organization, this was something that Zoe Harkham did. She looked at all of the cholesterol levels in all the countries that she could find and found quite a strong negative association between cholesterol and deaths from cardiovascular diseases across 180 countries or whatever it was. You know, the graph was fairly 
like that, you know, highest heart disease, lowest cholesterol, <laughs> lowest heart disease, highest cholesterol. Of course, however many countries do you want to look at, you know, it, so the whole thing is, is it, you know, we're told the Framingham, go back, the Framingham study was done many years ago. It's a small town near Boston in the US where they basically, it's a bit like the Truman Show, they got everybody, <laughs> measured everything, and <laughs> said, so, what is associated with heart disease? And, they, and, 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 and it came out with figures which were actually the exact opposite of what the figures said. The, the figures said that a, a fall in your LDL level, uh, each 1% fall of your LDL, the cholesterol, not LDL, resulted in a 2% reduction in heart disease. But actually, if you look at the, the figures, and, and this is the actual figures, the people who had a falling, the, the, the highest risk factor for dying of cardiovascular disease was having a falling cholesterol level. Yeah. And in fact, it was like, I can't remember the exact figures off the top of my head, but it was something like if your cholesterol level fell by converting to U, European figures, one millimole per liter, your risk of dying of cardiovascular disease went up 500%. That was over 20 years of the study. So you go, well, yeah, okay. It is everywhere you look, you can find contradictions. It's, it's actually quite hard to find populations where you don't find contradictions. What amuses me most of all is that very recently in the UK, we have a thing called the UK Biobank Study. You've heard of this, right? Well, yeah. I heard from your interview with Christopher last yeah. week uh, on the book. So. Yeah. That's right. Well, the UK Biobank Study, is, is, I like it as an idea, except it's run by someone who I don't particularly like. But anyway, the idea is you gather all the data you can about people and say, what are the things that influence uh, diseases, cancer, heart disease, whatever. And, and they're doing genetic studies as well, um, which, which, which does run into problems. But in general, the general concept's okay, I think. So they looked at cardiovascular disease and they said, well, what, what's associated with cardiovascular disease? What can we find? Well, they couldn't find any genetic markers, by the way. That's a hidden away thing. There was nothing specific, all right? What they, what they looked at and they found that, well, diabetes was associated with like a 3.5 increase risk and smoking was 2.7. Or I, I, These figures are off the top of my head. Very high blood pressure, 1.8 times risk. And they looked at per one millimole per liter increase in cholesterol levels was associated with an increased risk of 0 0.98, which to you and me is one, and one is average, all right? In other words, there was no association, and this is looking at, I think it was 500, thousand people in one part of the study and five million in the other part of the study no association could be found at all at all but if you read the paper the, the figures are there there's no comment on this anywhere in the paper it's quite amusing it's almost like better keep quiet about this bit because there was another study done in the uk looking at risk factors where they got all the information from 400,000, nearly 500,000 people from gp records and they said let's have a look at what's associated with, with dying of, of cardiovascular disease. And there were 48 factors identified, some of which were, were slightly weird things, like, like your, your liver enzyme levels and whatever. But these are just things that GPs measure. And out of the 48 factors, coming in at number 46, with an increased risk of 0 0.001, was your LDL level, because they measured LDL. In other words, there was no increased risk at all with an increased level of LDL in this study. And, and there you go. I mean, you know, I could quote, I mean, I could bore you. <laughs> Don't invite me around to your Christmas party. <laughs> so I can quote this stuff for hours. Uh, so it's not like there's just one piece of information standing out that may be a problem. It's like almost every piece of information you can find is a contradiction to the underlying hypothesis. And that, that's a key point, and, and many listeners will be aware because I go on about it. Uh, Professor Karl Popper, uh, logic and science uh, man, came out with some genius stuff on, on the nature of proof. And the asymmetry of proof is, is what he came out with. And it's stunning and it's so important. I'll, I'll just describe it briefly again. There's an asymmetry in proof. And the asymmetry or the lack of balance is that you can have many, many positive bits of evidence supporting a hypothesis, and they never prove it, right? You can have massive evidence of white swans being the only swans, but one black swan turns up and the hypothesis is over that there are only white swans, even though you had myriad proofs 
because you went to Venezuela and you went to Botswana and you went everywhere and you kept finding, yes, all the swans are white. It never proves it. The asymmetry is that if you find one negative proof against hypothesis, it's over. There is no debate or discussion. It's over. Now, you might rewrite the hypothesis, change it to accommodate, but it's over. But as you're saying, it's not one or two negative proofs against the cholesterol hypothesis where you could change the hypothesis a little to accommodate them. You know, that could be valid if you're honest. But it's not one or two. It's everywhere you turn. Everywhere you turn. In, in biophysics, if you look at correlations, if you look at epidemiology and framing them and all those, you look at the machine learning, uh, advanced studies like you mentioned there with the 500,000 people and it pulls out what's relevant. Yada, 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 yada. Even the fundamental chemistry doesn't make sense. And we're going to get into that because you're going to get into, and before we do, the actual process. The other one I'd love to hear again, you did with Christopher, is the movement of the LDL particles across the into the arterial wall. And that lady lecturer many years ago who first caught your attention, uh, that discussion around the transfer of LDL across the wall, we, we got to do that one. Oh, well, that lady is, uh, was Elspeth Smith, who ironically uh, taught me, uh, well, taught me part of what I learned about cardiology in Aberdeen University in a small group learning session. She said, LDL cannot move across the endothelium. And um, and at the time, I didn't know what LDL was and I didn't know what the endothelium was, but there was something about the way she said it. I thought, there's something there. Who is this person? Uh, Ironically, a few years later, I was reading papers by E. Smith and I thought, who's E? It must be Edward. (laughs) uh, It's it's actually Elspeth because women didn't write scientific papers and uh, clearly it couldn't have been a woman writing such a thing. Um, I never really spoke to her or discussed it with her beyond that but then it 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 later came to me when i started looking at well what's the process so what process can't it be what process can it be so if you think of ldl as as a a little taxi particle you think of an ldl molecule as being about the size of a human being Uh, endothelial cells which line all your blood vessels throughout your whole body and act a bit like tiles lining a a wall or, or or a tube station or something of course they're much more complicated than that um and an endothelial cell is about the size of a Wembley football stadium or a large football stadium, just to give you some idea of the, the sort of size. Anyway, so the current idea is obviously that if you have more LDL in your bloodstream, it will leak through the endothelium, which is this single layer with a, bit of a few other bits and pieces, and into the arterial wall behind where it then gradually builds up and gradually builds up and builds up these thickenings. Well, of course, the first thing is, though, is well, why is it, why does it only happen in certain places? And why does it not happen in veins or in the blood supply circulation in your in your lungs? Why only in arteries does this happen? And why only in bits of your arteries? If it's all leaking through everywhere, it should just thicken up as a kind of gradual thickening process. But anyway, leaving that aside, that requires that this little little LEL particle can get comes up to the endothelium and then passes straight through it and then travels about half a mile, it would be, if you were a human being. To the other side of the cell wall cell where it goes up to the other side of the membrane and then pops out again and then ends up in the in the artery wall behind so you think well that is a process that, that is required to happen but that process we know it can't happen because endothelium the cell membranes are, are barriers they're perfect barriers yes they allow certain things and we know from recent events that covid 19 viruses can can stick to a receptor on the cell membrane lock into that and then be drawn into the cell. We also know that LDL particles uh, or molecules or whatever you want to call them, as you know, a cell wants LDL inside it, it creates an LDL receptor. The LDL comes along, it locks onto it and it draws it into the cell. Well, that tells us two things. First of all, LDL can't get into a cell unless there's an LDL receptor there. So the cell must want it in. So this idea that if there's more or higher concentration in the bloodstream, well, the cell doesn't care what the concentration is in the bloodstream. It can keep everything out. Cells can, cells can prevent the, the, the passage of single atoms or ions. There are channels in your cell membrane that allow the passage of ions in and out. And, and, and an LDL molecule would be, 
if, if, if an L in moving sizes again, if a single atom is the size of a, a man in a rowing boat, you know, an LDL molecule would be the size of a super tank. So this, the cell can keep single atoms out. And yet the idea is if the concentration is higher in the blood, it will just go straight through the cell membrane, rush through the cell and pop out the other side. Now that requires processes that do not exist in nature. First of all, it would require an inside out LDL receptor on the other side of the, of the cell membrane. No one's ever suggested such a thing can possibly exist or what its function would be but then grabs hold of the LDL and pops it out the other side. This mechanism does not exist, all right? So the mechanism of transportation through an endothelial cell does not exist. We also partly have from proof that your brain has to make its own cholesterol. And the reason why it has to make its own cholesterol is because LDL cannot get in past what's called the blood-brain barrier, all right? So there are cells in your brain called glial cells that support neurons. One of their functions is to produce the synthesized cholesterol and it transports it about in a different form of lipoprotein. Don't worry, it gets all complicated. So we know that LDL can't get through the, an endothelial cell. So then the other argument is, oh, well, it gets between the, the endothelial cells. And you go, well, have you ever looked at how endothelial cells link together in, you know, in blood vessels? Well, they're linked together, they're enormously complicated. This thing called tight junctions, translocation junctions, and, and it's a bit like you've got zips and, and buttons, and, and they link together proteins, strong protein links, all the way across that link together, because they can't allow anything to go between them either. Because if you allow anything to slip between endothelial cells, it will, it will slip between endothelial cells. It will get into what they call the interstitial fluid, fluid between cells, and it will kill you because you need to keep this environment absolutely straight. There is a, there's a, there is a journal called Tissue Barriers, which I read. And, and, you, know, you can imagine it's a real page <laughs> turn. And, and, and I can't remember the exact quote, but it's like, you know, all, all material must pass through endothelial cells because if they could pass between, you know, the, the, the barrier, the endothelial barrier, they could pass between um, cells and cell membranes, we would immediately be dead. It's a prerequisite for life that things cannot pass between cells. It's an absolute prerequisite. Now, it does get more complicated at a very micro level where within your kidneys and your, your liver, things obviously have to come out and inside cells because otherwise none of these organs would work. But that's happening at a very small level. The larger size level of all the blood vessels where this happens, you can't get anything through an endothelial cell and you can't get anything past an endothelial cell. It is, I hate to use the word impossible in science because someone will come along and show it, you know. However, it is as close to being an impossible thing as, as there can be. And yet and that, is the, that is the mechanism by which cholesterol, aka LDL, is supposed to cause thickenings in your arteries and that neither of these processes neither of these things can happen it's impossible for it to happen so you have an impossible hypothesis and it's a yet another example of the lipidologists and the day springs or atias or whatever they depend on that absurdity for all of the other stuff they talk about that goes into the intricacies of the particles and how many there are and what size they are and all this other stuff is all built on sand wet sand because of what you said and the thing is this is what they always do they avoid going into the simple basic biophysics that underpin the hypothesis because here there be monsters and i guess they know it if they go into the core processes well that's a dangerous place to be because you'll be outed so they make sure they never go there they always stay in the other stuff and i was just thinking tissue barriers there i just had an image of fingers pushing through or something the the journal of Andrex and the <laughs> toilet paper. Well, 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 of course, <laughs> there, there, are, there, are, there are enormously complicated. I mean, you're prof, it, it, you know, it is complicated. I mean, obviously, yeah. in your gut, you, you eat food, and your food has to get out of your bowel and into your bloodstream. Otherwise, you're not going to live for very long. But boy, what goes on in your bowels and how, how, it, how that works. And, you know, just as an 
example there, Malcolm, I remember going through this, well, back 2012 when I started into this whole field. But uh, yeah, the triglycerides that come in, the fats you eat, and I found it quite stunning at the time, what I was learning in the first days, right? But the triglycerides that are three fatty acids with a glycerol backbone, so think of it like a fork, triglycerides, they come in in the fat, they get broken up into single monoglycerides, right? They then get brought across and they get packaged back into triglyceride on the other side in your body and into chylomicrons. Oh, yeah, well, well, of course, <laughs> you know that in order to absorb fat, then the bile that comes out of your gallbladder is basically <laughs> cholesterol. Yeah. And so uh, one, one, one molecule of fat attaches to one molecule of cholesterol to form a cholesterol ester. And then that's absorbed. Then it's packaged into a big thing called a chylomicron. And then that big thing, which is like much bigger than an LDL or whatever, travels straight from your gut, straight into your bloodstream. It doesn't go through your liver and distributes the fats uh, all around your body, which are then reconverted. This is what they call the futile cycle, where these triglycerides are broken down into yeah. individual uh, fatty acids and reconstructed. And it's just, I mean, your body's just doing these like, what? How is that happening? And then, so of course, the fat that you eat, any fat that you eat does not actually go into your liver at any point, a very, very yeah. tiny amount. The fat that's in your liver is actually made from carbohydrates or sugars. So, so the irony is, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like, it, do you not even know these things? I mean, people just don't even know these things. It's amazing, isn't it? So the fat you eat ends up in a big, bloody great thing called a kind of micron that travels around losing, losing all its fat until it's, it's shrunk from the size of a basketball to the size of a golf ball. And then the liver says, well, I'll have that then, incorporates it in, breaks it down, does what it does with it. But if you eat carbohydrates, whatever the carbohydrate sugars, they're turned into simple sugars, go to your liver. The liver thinks, I've got too many of these kicking around. The only thing I can do is convert them into fats, fatty acids, stick them into a thing called, a, which we call a triglyceride, which is a VLDL, transport them out of the liver, where they then travel around the body losing their fats, and then come back to the liver, as an LDL and the liver says, right, I'll have that back again. I mean, one of the fascinating things was David Diamond told me this, and uh, I presumed it was true, but I'd never seen it proof. If you have people, young children who've got really severe raised cholesterol called homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, and their cholesterol levels, LDL levels can be 60, when they're normally three. Now this does cause problems because your blood's like goo, if you like. Um, mm. And anyway, if you do a liver transplant on these children, their LDL level straight back to normal, instantaneously. Right? Wow. Okay. I, yeah. You didn't know that, and did you? I didn't know that one, and because I've done so much research myself, but also hoovered up all of yours, I figured I'd do everything. No, I hadn't heard about that one. Um, that's interesting, and I'm going to get that off you later. And you know, to your fat point. There was a study Gabor Dosi sent me. He sent me myriad studies, and they're all fantastic, especially twin studies, which prove all of what we're saying. I love the twin studies, you know, genetic twins, and you get to get real answers. But there was one that radio labeled fats in a meal, and they fed a bunch of volunteers three meals during the day, and they radio tracked the actual fat molecules from the meals to see where they went. The outcomes were stunning. There were so many stunning outcomes from this that I'll just touch on one, though, that I found amusing. Like you say, it's ironic. The people who are healthy, the fats were rapidly taken up into fat cells, which is the storage to be released later when you're fasting, uh, and appropriate places. The people who are insulin resistant, they were not really taken up so well into the proper depots or depots, as the Americans say. They tended to end up going to the liver, where the liver packaged VLDLs out of them, hence shooting up your ApoB LDL particle number, right? So the insulin resistance there was shown beautifully as the mechanism, one of the mechanisms, as to why the higher particle number correlates with heart disease. But it's to do with insulin resistance. It's nothing to do with the particle. Well, of course it is. I mean, the other irony is that, that, that they find that within athero, well, where they find that, that the fatty acids that they do find 
are, are generally palmitic acid anyway um, and and they say well therefore palmitic acid is 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 actually really bad stuff to eat no 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 it's because the liver makes palmitic acid yeah. right, out of carbohydrates you idiots right. and you don't understand anything you're looking at you know, I, I think it's about 95% palmitic acid is, is the fatty acid of choice made by the liver. Saturated fatty acid, of course, because the liver yeah. will make unhealthy yeah. things for you to 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 distribute around your body. So it is like every single piece of information, as you say, is twisted around the wrong way around. And and it, it is, uh, did you ever watch Stranger Things where it's like the upside down world? No, it's a mm. Netflix thing. It's quite good fun. So anyway, it's sci-fi nonsense, but... Anyway, there is mm. our world and there's the upside down world underneath where everything is kind of twisted around and 108% wrong and there's little nasty things happen there. You know, the cholesterol hypothesis and everything around it, the saturated fat hypothesis and the diet heart hypothesis is like the upside down world. In that world, everything makes sort of sense. But when you actually look at it compared to the real world, none of it works. You, you, yeah. It's almost like you've created, I, I sometimes use the example of the geocentric model of the universe, which is, the Earth is at the center. The sun goes around the Earth. The moon goes around the Earth. The planets go around the Earth. The stars go around the Earth. Everything goes around the Earth. Well, you can sort of make that model work just about. You can make the observations fit. The, 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 but you do have a problem with planets because planets do this thing called retrograde motion where they go in a loop and then go off. Because if you're looking up and you're going at that speed and the planet's going at that speed, it will appear to go backwards in the sky at times. So, so actually, they did create models where these wandering stars went around in little loops and if you accepted that a wandering star could go around in a loop the rest of your model worked but you always had these wandering stars it's like hold on what are those <laughs> that doesn't make any sense at all but yeah. and you can do with it you can do with cholesterol if you say it's ldl and it's apoa like protein molecules well you can make that work into a hypothesis if you ignore what is actually going on if you, if, because what you're doing is you're just finding a further accurate, more accurate association with heart disease, not a causal thing. And then you're making everything fit. It's like the Antikythera mechanism that they discovered in, in Greece, which you could turn a little, a little wheel and it made all the planets and the stars move around correctly with the Earth at the center, you know. And, and we have, you know, I, I think the cholesterol hypothesis is like yeah, the, the world's modern Antikythera mechanism. You can make, your observations work so long as you never actually question the central idea, which is, you know, I, or I, I then use the example of a jigsaw puzzle, which is like, here's a thousand pieces, they throw them on the ground. This is what causes cardiovascular disease. By the, but by the way, there are two pieces. There is saturated fat and there is cholesterol or LDL. Those two pieces fit in the middle of this puzzle. All right. And they fit right there in the middle and all your other pieces must be made to fit around them. And so, your puzzle, you can make it kind of work. You can bend pieces here and there. And you can make parts of your puzzle all look fantastically good. But in the end point is you cannot make your puzzle work if you have these two pieces in the middle. You can't. You have to take them out and throw them away. Because only yep. then can you say, well, we've got rid of those stupid ideas. Now we can look at heart disease and we've forgotten about these things which cannot be made to fit. You can batter them with a hammer. You can twist and bend all the other parts around them, which is what people do. You can change and adjust your hypothesis to make them almost apparently work. The bottom line is, like the, like the geocentric model, you've still got these things going around in circles that you cannot explain. However hard you try, there's the anomaly, the ghost in the machine, the thing that's telling you you're wrong, you know? Yeah. And, and in this case, it's not even one key thing, uh, like, like the planet's example. It's nearly bloody everything which just makes it astonishing but like you say hammering those pieces in for decades now we have a food and a pharmaceutical industry no conspiracy theory let's be honest they fund armies of jigsaw hammerers uh who publish all the time so that that's the problem we have that's a good segue or to tilt around to you know let's make that jigsaw properly now so this won't be a world first because you're on christopher's podcast but still, I'll take second best. And we will go through the process of atherosclerosis yeah. that fits into an exquisite jigsaw. Uh, nothing's perfect because there's always some phrase 
at the edge where you don't have every single piece of data, right, locked down. But this is as perfect a jigsaw as you can get, and it's very elegant. And interestingly, like all the problems I've solved in my corporate career, after you've solved it or, or made the jigsaw that fits, it can actually be in some ways kind of simple, um, possibly. Let, let's see. Yeah, well, um, uh, I always like to say the best scientific hypothesis are ones once you come up with them, everyone goes, well, that was bloody obvious, wasn't it? You know? Yeah, true. You know, and I think, and I like to think people go, well, <laughs> in fact, um, Sebastian Rose Rushworth, a doctor in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Sweden, as he said, uh, you know, why have I been so stupid that I didn't think of that? Well, I'd like to say, obviously, I'm not a great genius. This idea is not mine. And most parts of it are not mine. Elspeth Smith had obviously clearly worked it all out. 40 years ago, gives you some idea of how old I now am, and um, <laughs> 42 years ago, <laughs> and uh, she, she, she'd obviously been thinking about it and looked at it and realised, well, she'd started looking, she'd obviously looked at the process and said, well, LDL can't cross the endothelium, so it can't be that. What is it? And she said, well, when she looked at atherosclerotic plaques and she looked at what they were, what she was saying to herself, and, and this had been said before, but they look awfully like blood clots. These look like blood clots in various stages of repair and metamorphosis. They're clearly like if you, years ago, I tried to break into my own house and managed to slash, slash my wrist, which you probably, if you can see that, maybe not, it's gone away, um, and bled all over the roof while holding onto my wrist and sliding down the roof going, help. And um, it now, uh, it looks like uh, it's white and it looks calcified because it is calcified. Um, mm. Because in the end, tissue repairs itself and it looks nothing like what it did at the start and you've heard of keloid scars where people scratch mm. themselves and especially people with black skin or, or if, if they scratch they can get these big lumps that, that develop it's called a keloid scar so it's an over reaction you can get granulomas and things so what the original damage looks like can bear a very little relationship to what it ends up like you can see what was in there and if you go back to 1852, and a man called Karl von Rokitansky, he came up with it. It's called the incrustation hypothesis. He said when he looked at atherosclerotic plaques working in Vienna, they look exactly like blood clots to him in various stages of repair. And he actually wrote about this. Um, and he was floored by uh, his colleague called Rudolf Burkow, who very well known in Germany and Austria, there's Burkow Institutes and Burkow Hospitals and Burkow everything. So he obviously did rather better than, than uh, Rokitansky. And he said, well, how can a blood clot be underneath, well, let's say endothelium, this layer of cells I'm talking about, how can it be underneath that? Because blood clots don't form inside tissue, they form in the blood. And Rokitansky had no answer to this at the time. Now, had he been born 140 years later, he would have known that actually the endothelial cells, this is, this is where it comes to, the endothelial cells themselves, they line all your blood vessels, but where they cannot come from, you know, in your skin, if you scratch your skin, you, it will bleed, and then you'll get a clot. And then this underlying skin will grow up and force it off, and the clot will, will fall off. But in your arteries, there's only one layer of endothelial cells. There's nothing underneath them. After years of development, that can change. So there's nothing to grow up underneath the endothelium. Equally, if a blood clot did form on your on your blood vessel, and then it would just popped off and, and went shooting off down your blood vessel, it would jam up somewhere further down. So that would that would be what would, would be rather disastrous. You can see that happening quite a common place for, for clotting and atherosclerosis in the arteries of the neck. And blood clots can form on top of these areas, and then they can break off and go into your brain. That's the commonest cause of a stroke. So the body doesn't want blood clots breaking off and traveling down your circulatory system because that's the sort of thing that can kill you so assume for the sake of argument you've got a blood vessel the endothelial cells are lining it and some of them get damaged and then a blood clot forms on top of it this is the basic start process endothelial damage so you've got a blood clot it's stuck to your artery wall what are you going to do with it well the first thing you do is you shave it down and this process is called fibrinolysis which shaves the clot down but obviously, if you shaved it down to nothing, then all you'd have was a further exposed area and a blood clot would just form, and then another blood clot would form, another blood clot. That would be a stupid process. So the bit of the blood clot that's most closely 
attached to the artery wall doesn't get shaved down. So what happens is your bone marrow produces new endothelial cells. They're called endothelial progenitor cells because they're kind of immature. They float around in your bloodstream. I don't know how many. It's a trillion in your bloodstream. When they see an area of damage, they attach themselves to it, and then they grow into fully mature endothelial cells. And another one grows here, one grows here, one grows here. And eventually what you have is a new layer of endothelium on top of the blood clot. And the blood clot is now underneath the endothelium. So Rokitansky didn't know that could happen. Had he known that process, had he known there were cells, these cells were only discovered in the mid 1990s. No one knew they were there before. I looked at research in the 1960s where they deliberately damaged blood vessels of animals and, and saw these funny spindly shaped cells appearing and, and still couldn't work out what they were looking at. Anyway, that's, that's what happened. So you then end up, you've got a little bit of a blood clot inside your blood vessel wall. And normally the repair systems would come and get rid of it and it would be gone. That's happening probably, I hate to say to you, all the time. Now, people who smoke cigarettes, if you get a healthy volunteer who smokes one cigarette, you can see, because you can measure endothelial cell damage and death, the thing called microparticles appear in your bloodstream. And you get a healthy volunteer to smoke one cigarette, and you can find millions of microparticles floating around in your bloodstream. So you've killed millions of endothelial cells. At the same time, your bone marrow is stimulated to produce more endothelial cells, so the repair process kicks in in parallel with the damage, which is good news. Of course, in the end, if you if you damage too rapidly, your repair systems cannot keep up. And that is really the, the, the thinking is that atherosclerosis or the, the buildup of these things is really what happens when damage outstrips repair. So a blood clot forms, it's partially repaired, and then another one forms on top of it, and you've got a bigger than you wanted one. And then it becomes very difficult to get rid of it entirely. So it becomes an area of weakness, if you like, or a slight thickening. And when you've got these areas, this is where more episodes are likely to occur. So it's a kind of repeat episode. The vast majority of these clotting processes don't block your artery completely, because if they did, you would be having heart attacks and strokes all the time, and you don't. So if you say your artery starts that size, and then it narrows down to that size, and it narrows down to that size, narrows down to that size, that size, that size, that size, that size. We were talking about years here. And then gradually it's like that size. And then eventually you're going to be able to block that narrowed section fully. And that is the terminal event. So the terminal event, which is a blood clot occurring on top of an existing plaque. By the way, this is widely accepted. This is not controversial, just me. Everyone in medicine. Every cardiologist will tell you that's the final event in heart disease and strokes. It's not quite, but it'll do. And increasingly, people are recognizing that, that if you look at a, a plaque area in an artery, which is, is actually, the artery remains circular, by the way, because it doesn't, doesn't end up, but never mind. If you look at it, basically, the, the, what you see is if you, do, if you do angiograms on arteries, yearly on people who've got known heart disease. What you don't see is that it gradually thickens and does that. What happens is you'll look and it'll suddenly be that size. And then it'll suddenly be that size. It's called phasic growth, right? Mm. It doesn't gradually increase as, as LDL gets into your blood vessel one molecule at a time. What's happening is you're getting a, a clot. The clot is repaired, but that leaves you with a larger plaque. Now that is, you know, I could find you a million studies showing that that is accepted that that's what's going on so when you've got heart disease you've got you've got the final event is a blood clot the the growth of a plaque is a blood clot but what the mainstream won't accept is that that is also what starts it in the first place because it's LDL that starts it off by going into your blood vessels which we've just discussed is an impossible um, process and then blood clotting takes over I said, well, no, all, all that this hypothesis is suggests is it's blood clotting from start to finish. It's the same process. It's the same process all the way through. It's just you damage the endothelium, blood clot forms, it's repaired, it's gone. If you accelerate the damaging process, you've got a problem. I, I sometimes liken it to, to, um, to, to potholes on a road, whereby you know, roads, if you 
don't do any repair on them, you actually end up with enormous potholes. So the council has to come along and cover them over and repair them. Mm. So long as they're doing that fast enough, you don't have a pothole problem. If they're not doing that fast enough, you have a major pothole problem. So it really is just a balancing act here between this is going on all the time. So what you've got to try to do is, is reduce the amount of things that you do that can be damaging to the endothelium, because that will reduce the damage part of it. You've got to reduce things that make the blood clots that form bigger and more difficult to get be got rid of. And you've got to enhance the repair systems in your body as much as you can. Now, obviously, the thing that damages your repair processes more than anything is getting old, unfortunately, which is why age is such a major risk factor. Because when you're younger, your repair systems are probably going, ha-ha, 20 cigarettes a day, no problem. You know, but as you get older, then you've got a problem occurring. So what you have to try and do is reduce the damage bits and increase the repair bits. And if you can achieve this balance, so then you say to yourself, well, you know, so what are the most damaging things that can cause? That's over to you. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's what we try to I have another book here. My God, it's 2017 this came out, but we, uh, we cover that in great detail. But you cover in The Clot Thickens uh, in plenty of detail the whole list of things you do. And, of course, they mirror essentially exactly what myself and Dr. Gerber had, uh, not because we're in groupthink, but because that's just the way it is. <laughs> but this process that you described there so eloquently, uh, if I may say so, even though you're Scottish, um, this process, that's the jigsaw there. That's the kernel of the jigsaw that clicks together beautifully. And then all the rest of the wider jigsaw goes around it and fits in too. Everywhere the cholesterol hypothesis, when you look at logic, data, and actual science of what's happening, uh, it fails, right? All your lipidology associational nonsense passes because it's peripheral, it's meaningless, it's built on sand. But the core stuff, this one then fits, I think, with every genuine fact or, or, or reality around the science, the biology. Uh, there may be exceptions. I don't think there are. We'll get to those. But let's look through the ones it does fit with. If you take genetic susceptibility and hotspots of atherosclerosis, where there's uh, junctions in the arterial tree, and you know, that fits perfectly, right, with this uh, process. Well, I think, I mean, yeah, because I mean, I'm not, I'm not uh, in a way, a lot of the things that mainstream is saying, I'm, I'm in agreement with. You know, if you've got high blood pressure, if you, you have, as you say, areas of bifurcation in the arteries where there's more turbulent flow, there's more stress on the endothelium. These tend to be the points where, where, where the plaques develop. I and mean, why do the plaques develop most in the heart, for example? Well, as someone said, you know, the heart is a unique because, because the blood flows through most blood vessels when the heart contracts. But when the heart contracts, the blood stops flowing through the coronary arteries because the pressure on the arteries is so great, it blocks the flow. It's only when it relaxes that the blood can flow. So someone described a coronary artery as it's like someone stamping on a, on a garden hose 60 times a day. There's an enormous amount of biomechanical stress on coronary arteries. So, so that fits with that, the blood, the blood pressure is, is a thing. I mean, when you look at smoking, yes, well, clearly smoking, we can see that it damages the lining of the blood vessels. When you look at air pollution, if you look at small particle air pollution, these nanoparticles get into your bloodstream and, and they bump up against the endothelial cells and they do them damage and they die. So, so you know, air pollution, which has decreased a lot recently, you know, is, 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 is a good thing. So that, you know, that also fits. And then when you look at, um, at raised blood sugar level, now this is fascinating because, uh, you know, you ask 100 doctors, have you ever heard of the glycocalyx and they'll look at you blankly. Well, the glycocalyx is the lining of all endothelial cells have. And it's a bit like, you know, if you try to pick up a fish, not all fish, they slip through your fingers because they're covered in glycocalyx, which is really slippery, slippery stuff, better than Teflon. And it consists of the, the glycocalyx comes from the fact it's made of glucose protein structures that are a bit like tendrils or, or grass or whatever that stick out of your endothelial cells and form this kind of lining protective lining around all of your endothelial cells. And it's hugely important 
but protecting them within the glycocalyx lurks, anticoagulation factors, things that stop your blood clotting, just really potent things that make sure that, that, that nothing hits the endothelial cell and damages it. And it also stops things sticking to endothelial cells. So, so your glycocalyx is hugely important for protection of your endothelium. And you can actually measure this. I mean, there is a mechanism, there's a thing called a glycometer, which you can stick under your tongue and it looks at your blood vessels under your tongue. And you can look at the you can look at the, the endothelial the, the capillaries under your tongue and you can see how thick the, the glycocalyx is. And thicker glycocalyx is good, thinner glycocalyx is bad. When people actually have sepsis, you can measure the difference in thickness of the glycocalyx with regard to how serious the sepsis is. Quite a good measure of how likely you are to live or die if you have sepsis is your glycocalyx thickness. Oh, but by the way, the reason why sepsis kills you is that is that bacteria get into your bloodstream, they multiply the waste products of bacteria called exotoxins. And these exotoxins travel around your circulatory system, wiping out endothelial cells, mm. destroying the glycocalyx. And then you get blood clots all the way through your body. And you get a thing called disseminated intravascular coagulation, disseminated widespread intravascular within your blood vessels, coagulation, blood clots. That's why, you know, you get people who get menin meningitis, sepsis, they end up losing the tip of their noses or fingers or arms because of the blood supplies being shut off. And the thing that kills them is the organ damage normally. So, so exactly the same thing that kills you with sepsis is what kills you with smoking, is what kills you with you raise blood pressure. The mechanism may seem a million miles, or the, the, the factor may seem hugely far apart. The process is always the same. You're damaging the glycocalyx or you're damaging the endothelial cells or both. And when you have diabetes, your blood sugar level is, goes shooting up. And a raised blood sugar level has been shown to thin and damage the glycocalyx of all cells in your body, all endothelial cells in your body. And this becomes particularly important when you look at, at, at some of the, the smaller vessel damage you get is particularly important in diabetes. Because as you know, with diabetes, you get eye problems, and kidney problems and nerve cell problems because the circulation and the blood supply to these very small areas, if you like, these very small cells is damaged. Now in the kidneys are hugely vascular and they've got enormous and complicated capillary systems inside them for the, for the waste products that go in and out of the kidney function, the nephrons. If you damage these endothelial cells, your kidneys are starting to struggle. And because the diabetes damages the, the small capillary in glycocalyx, you get this, what they call microvascular disease, MVD, which many people say is a different thing than atherosclerosis. Well, it is because obviously you couldn't have uh, an atherosclerotic plaque in a capillary as I've likened it to a, a, a snake swallowing an elephant. If there isn't any room for an atherosclerotic plaque in a capillary. What happens in capillaries instead is they just blow up, they burst. Mm -hmm they die they you know so so, the, so so what it looks like is very different the process is basically you damage the endothelial cell the endothelial cell dies the capillary bursts you've no longer got a capillary so your problem is it starts to kill off nephrons in your kidneys it starts to kill off blood vessels in the back of your eye where you can actually see these bursting signs of burst blood vessels due to the damage that the raised blood sugar level has done to the more small blood vessels in your eyes and obviously also the peripheral blood vessels in, in your, in, you know, towards your skin start to die off. So people with diabetes, if they get a scratch, they get an ulcer and it really doesn't bleed because the circulation is, is being diminished in these areas. And of course the peripheral nerves need good blood supply. And so blood supply starts to get shut off because you're damaging these small blood vessels. You start to lose sensation in your fingers and your feet. And it's exactly the same process as it's causing the atherosclerosis in the larger vessels, because in the larger vessels, the glycocalyx is obviously still there. The damage to your endothelium is still there. Uh, uh, and this is what is going on. So in a way, it's very simple then to link, you know, you want to link sepsis to diabetes. You know, while I was writing this book, COVID came along and I was writing a, a, a chapter on vasculitis D's, which is the plural vasculitis, which is inflammation of, of blood vessels. And, and it became clear that what COVID-19 was doing was essentially the same thing as you can see in acute vasculitis. And 
what's happening is with COVID-19, obviously, it gets into endothelial cells primarily where it multiplies and then bursts out and kills the cell or alters it or, or alerts the immune system. There's something not very nice inside me. Please come and kill me, which is what cells do. They, when a cell is infected with a virus, it releases things called, called um, cytokines, which are basically mem messengers, uh, proteins, and says, I'm infected, you know, and, and cells around it start listening to that. And the immune system goes, right, well, if you're infected, matey, I'm coming to kill you. So this is what they call the cytokine storm, which is this process where the immune system winds itself up. This COVID is within cells. These cells have mutated themselves slightly. They're releasing pleas to be destroyed and the immune system comes and it destroys them. And that's when you get the, the blood clotting and the serious damage from COVID in the cardiovascular system after it's moved out of the lungs, if you like. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can link, you can link COVID to, to smoking. It's, of course, it's a more acute situation, but, you know, autoimmune diseases were quite often affect the, 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 the circulatory system. So they're called vasculitis. So you have rheumatoid arthritis causes a vasculitis. You know, systemic lupus erythematosus causes a vasculitis. There are pure vasculitis diseases as well, and they cause premature heart disease. So once you start opening up the layers of this onion, you say, okay, so, ah, oh, I can see how that fits. All right, so, so a vasculitis is clearly the same thing as the smoking, or, or say taking cocaine. People say, well, why does cocaine increase your risk of heart disease, which it does hugely? Well, you say, well, you snort cocaine, what's one of the first things that happens is your nose falls apart because the membrane, the septum, is disintegrated. You say, well, okay, so what's happening there? Because cocaine causes severe inflammation and damage and breakdown of the small blood vessels in your septum. So it dies. So they say, well, what do you think is happening to the cocaine that's getting around the rest of your body? It's damaging your endothelial cells. It's damaging your glycolic and it's doing exactly the same thing as smoking. It's doing it very acutely. But when you look at cocaine use, it's causing exactly the same problem. So a, a bit like we're already saying, when, once, you, once you start looking at it this way, you can bring things together and say, well, what else can damage the endothelium? You know, what, what else can do this? And, and you can find hundreds of things. And you can bring them all together and say, right, well, I can understand that now. I can, I can understand that now. Because one fact, remember we are talking about the machine learning, was when it said, what, are the, what is the most important single, it's not necessarily a cause, but association with cardiovascular disease? What's the most potent finding they came across? It was a thing called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is, used to be called chronic bronchitis in the old days, and sometimes it's called other things. But basically it means that your lungs are damaged, used often by smoking, but coal miners, this can happen to you, people working in highly polluted environments. And you think, well, how can lung damage increase your risk of cardiovascular disease? Well, the answer is, as we've discussed, if you smoke, if you take in toxic substances through your lungs, they escape into your bloodstream. And once they're in your bloodstream, they can cause all this downstream damage. So it's precisely the same thing going on again. And this, this is, mm. I mean, this, well, to an extent, this is the intellectual sort of almost this, this, this satisfaction of saying, ah, that fits, that fits, that fits, this fits, that fits. Oh, okay, find me things that don't fit. Well, I have looked, but but at the moment uh, it does seem that they all that they all fit, uh, even as one part of it. Yeah. And I've I have looked as well because uh, well, not the only reason. The fundamental art of problem solving is to look to disprove your hypothesis, not prove it. Any moron can go and prove it and find some associations and even pretty good looking evidence. The real problem solver seeks to disprove. And at the end of the process, when you cannot disprove any element, largely, uh, you've arrived. It's the opposite of what all these academics do. It's astonishing. But the COPD as well, COPD is almost nowadays, whatever about coal miners, it's almost a diagnosis for insulin resistance. It's so intimately bound to insulin resistance state. And another one occurred to me is uh, the focal nature of atherosclerosis, very simple one. I used to say, well, okay, you got high cholesterol here, and you got high cholesterol here. You have no plaque here, it's shiny, beautiful artery. You got a massive plaque here, it's gonna kill you. And the same will apply to a low cholesterol person. So the focal nature alone 
also ties in beautifully to the jigsaw. And if you think of all the cholesterol nonsense we were talking earlier, well, it wasn't our nonsense, it's their nonsense, but still, you take all the examples and anomalies, the catavans, lowest heart disease on the planet, even up to aged levels, they have almost no calcification when they study them. Incredibly low heart disease. The Americans, kind of the worst on the planet. The catavans have the same kind of particle number of LDL, the super measure of LDL. And yet they have no heart disease, and these guys have it. You got the old guy you were referencing who had a 17 millimole or something like seven or 800 milligram cholesterol, and he clean arteries in his late 60s, and they've been looking at him for 20 years. And then you got the young guy with the sickle cell, as you described, that damages and strains the arteries, low cholesterol, but getting limbs amputated from atherosclerosis. All explainable with the proper process you described. All of these different things all fit into the jigsaw. Well, I think it does, and that's the point. As you say, you should try and look for things that don't fit. Well, LDL doesn't fit. I mean, it, it doesn't. <laughs> No. And, and that, that's just a fact. I mean, you can look at things like saying, what about low protein levels? There's something nobody even measures, but there's a thing called albumin, which is a protein produced in your liver. There's lots and lots of it produced. If your liver stops producing too much albumin, well, that's a different disease, very, very. But um, people who've got low albumin levels have got an increased risk of heart disease. And, and you say, well, why can that be? And you say, well, albumin sits within the glycocalyx and nurtures it and provides the protein parts that are required to build it part of its function. It does all sorts of other things. So you look at albumin levels from a cholesterol hypothesis and it is just, there's no connection at all anywhere for that. It just doesn't exist, all right? Or you could look at, as you said, sickle cell disease. I started looking at this because I was actually looking for causes of pulmonary hypertension and other words, high blood pressure in your lungs, which was associated, but obliquely. And then I found these examples with sickle cell disease, which is where your blood vessels are sickle shaped and they're sharp and pointy at one end to be super simplistic. And, and you can find examples of this particular case history, a 14 year old boy, I think it might be 12, I think he was 14, who came in with gangrene of his left foot and because the circulation to his foot was so severely compromised because he had severe atherosclerosis in the arteries in his leg, also his other leg, and every other major artery in his body. His brother had died age five of a stroke. He had sickle cell disease. And you say, well, how can sickle cell disease be causing these problems? Well, the answer is, and in fact, the authors of the paper wrote it themselves. They said, you know, severe biomechanical damage to the lining of the arteries is what is causing the problem. Say, well, yeah, I entirely agree with you. Why don't you take that one step further and say, well, Therefore, that is what's causing the problem for everybody. <laughs> it's because too elegant. Process. It's elegant because it's true. Yeah. yeah it's... And, then, and then they find if you take uh, people with sickle cell disease, stand up large spleens because your blood, blood vessels go to your spleen to be broken down. If you've got sickle cell disease, there's more breakdown going on. Your spleen becomes enlarged. And, and when they take the spleens out, they look at the arteries. They're all full of, full of atherosclerosis. And you go... There you go. It's like, you know, as I did say to someone, I do feel like I'm standing here going, it's over there. It's standing there and it's going, hello, 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 it's me, it's me. And you're going, no, it's over and there. It's, it's like, no, no, it's there. Look, it's jumping up and down. It's waving at you and saying, it's me. And, it, and you're all looking over there at the wrong thing. You're, yeah. I can't it, see that. Thing. You know, it, it's to me, once you sort of see it, it you know, what's the expression? A one-eyed man in the line of the blind will be king. I said, well, maybe, but if all the blind people just keep refusing to open their eyes and look at the damn thing, you, know, you find yourself thinking, am I just wrong? Because to me, this is like, this is just standing there shouting. It's got a big yeah. banner up going, I cause heart disease, da, 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 da. you know, and, uh, and, and everyone just goes, no, no, it's not over there, is it? It's not cholesterol. So I am not interested. So it is, it's, it's, it is exciting but frustrating, but I suppose throughout, throughout history, Galileo pointed mm. at the, the, he apparently pointed his telescope at Saturn and said, look at the moons, and, and the, 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 the astronomers in the, in, the, in the Vatican said, well, we can't see anything. Yeah. 
Yes. What are you talking about? <laughs> you talking about? <laughs> look, look, there are yeah. moons going round. No, and if you, keep, if you keep pointing at the moons, then they'll get rid of you. They'll yeah. take care no, of you. You're the, dreaded, mean, you're the dreaded moon pointer. Yeah. No, I'm, it's over there. Look, look. Yeah. No, I can't see it. It doesn't exist. <laughs> You know, it's just, uh, it's almost comical, but it's so sad. But like, it's like Johnny Bowden used that analogy many, many years ago. And he was saying about the head or the, the street lamp. So the guy has lost his car keys. I said, well, where do you think you lost them? And he says, well, I, I think I dropped them, you know, just when I got out of the car. But he said, why are you searching here? He said, well, this is the only place I can see. You know, he, he's, he's just searching where he... Where it suits him to search it's absurd but we got to acknowledge no conspiracy theory and in fairness it was more ignorance and stupidity that set the cholesterol train in motion going all the way back to the russian guy in the 60s uh and ansel keys and all he may have at the start believed his own nonsense let's say but it's since then the 70s into 1980 approximately the cholesterol consensus commission where they met to stop people questioning cholesterol that's where it got more sinister and that's where industry piled in and then of course the statin drugs were going to be a massive money spinner so at that stage you can't question cholesterol because we got it massive businesses based on it so it was like kind of stupidity ignorance naivety created this monster and then, you know, chicanery and corporate, you know, profiteering and, and academic, you know, prestige. You know, I mean, all these academics who swore blind by cholesterol for 15, 20 years, imagine they begin to touch subconsciously on thinking, hmm, might be wrong. They're going to shut that out. There's no way they're going to say we were wrong for 20 or 30 years and we, we basically put you down the, from the frying pan into the fire. They're never going to admit that. So it's in everyone's interest, everyone, to keep it going. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, um, um, one of my quotes, I've forgotten who said it now, it's very difficult to get a man to believe in something if his salary depends upon him not believing it. Um, and yeah. Well, that's there. I, I know a lot of people, I'm sure, absolutely believe it. I don't know why they believe it, but they believe it. And, and, and they believe it with a, an intensity that is, is, is incredibly difficult to share. Um, it's, it's you know, an I, I, say, I would say to people, okay, well, let's debate process. I'll debate my pro. I'll tell you what I think my process is. You tell me what you think yours is. But as you say, they won't go down that route because once you get into process, it's kind of like, well, it gets into the archery wall, and you know, it's that bit where I always like to listen to that bit where they just jump it. You know, it's, it's uh, yeah, you know, and you they jump it. That, that bit. That bit where you, you know, it's like the rotating planet thing. It's like, now, I know you're explaining that there are stars that can rotate around like this, and you're telling me that's true. But I want to go into that into some more detail with you. you know, I want to get you to explain exactly what you think is going on. And as you say, you won't get that. You don't get that from anyone. Well, it just gets across the ashy wall. Yeah, it is. And I just thought of an analogy there, actually. I don't know where it came from, but a magnetic analogy. And uh, it's like the kernel of something, which is the process, which is getting to the correct hypothesis about the process. If you think of that like a north pole of a magnet, a very powerful magnet, it's like, dare I say it, it's worth, I'm flattering ourselves, we're like south poles of magnet to the north pole of the core process, you know, and challenging yourself gets you there and you hover around, you're drawn in, and you click. And that's what you've done today, or we've talked about today, the correct process, the jigsaw. All of these people are like, you know, a North Pole. They can go all around all of the science and all the lipidology, but whenever they stray near to the core, the process itself, that would negate everything they say, they're repelled from it. They can never touch it. And in their case, it's so powerfully so. It, it's like the, uh, is it the nuclear force? What's, there's one of the nuclear forces that's beyond belief. It's what holds an atom together. I think it's called the short nuclear force. That, that's the level they're at. Cognitive dissonance become like an art with these people. 
But you know what? I think um, I think we've done it today. We've covered, and you know what I might do is split this in two and just release them maybe together uh, because there is the first half is all the wrong process, very well uh, articulated. And then the second half, we did a nice switch into all of what it really is. Yeah. I mean, it's a perfect two-hander, I think. Fair play well, to you. Well, I think you might be right. Yeah, it's like the... Uh, it's like the uh... I think well, it is in a way it does naturally split. I mean, it's all very well destroying, and I've decided that's all very well destroying a hypothesis. But if you don't have anything to put in its place, people keep coming back to it. I think in the book I describe it as a bit like you know you can blow a planet up, but if there's no other gravitational well around, then everything just coalesces back around, and you're back again. You, know? you need you need another gravity well over here to say actually get you thinking over here. I I mean, I, I know that those people who are at the top the experts the super experts of this world will never change their minds and will no. fight and battle and i think it, it's never going to happen uh, what what i think you know, hope is that some people who are maybe at the beginning of their careers or, or other people who are not so uh, embedded in this and have so much less to lose might think yeah that makes more sense and um and then gradually hopefully the people can move, you know, towards this I, these ideas, um, which, which appear to me anyway. Uh, and of course, I'm biased mm. to, to to fit the yeah. the evidence. It's never that, going to be perfect, is it? But no, you know, science is always a move on. It's like take another step, yeah. you know, in a different direction. It's all you can hope for, isn't it? Oh yeah, never let the perfect be the enemy of very good or bloody good enough. At some point in an escalation or a complex problem, you've basically got it cracked. And yeah, there might be one or two little tendrils left, not fully closed out, but you can move on because you know you've, you know you've resolved it. It doesn't really matter if there's one or two little glitches. Once you verify that they're not dangerous glitches that could undermine your quality in the future, you verify that. But otherwise, you don't need to dot every single I. So that's a great way to leave it. Hope for the future. Uh, new, younger people who, who get it and then kind of convert to the correct <laughs> process. And then they become inoculated or resistant to the nonsense down the road when they hear it. And Why hopefully question it. The cholesterol hypothesis. <laughs> yeah. We need a cholesterol hypothesis vaccine to save us from, from the what's well, clearly a pandemic, yeah. uh, may, with no you, question. You may need a couple of boosters in the way. <laughs> oh, Every couple of weeks, I think, oh, yeah. do the right thing. Keep which safe. We, which, we call a, which we call a slot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff, Malcolm. Well, we leave it at that. My camera's about to run out of disc. And um, excellent. I'll get this out pretty quickly. And don't forget, guys, it is all in here. The clock thickens. The last word, essentially, on cardiovascular disease and its avoidance. Don't forget to subscribe and also to hit that little bell icon to make sure you're informed and get to counter some of the more corporate style science that's out there. So all the links are in the description box below and also really appreciate all my PayPal and Patreon supporters and anyone else who can continue to support me to provide all the material that I do. It's highly appreciated. So thank you.